This is InvestorIdeas.com, and we are talking today with Bundeep Rangar, CEO of Finequia International, traded on the CSE under FNQ. In the podcast, we discuss Finequia's latest news and how blockchain technology has disrupted the insurance sector. To hear more podcasts, visit the podcast page at InvestorIdeas.com forward slash audio. And a reminder, you can also hear our podcast on Spotify, iTunes, TuneIn, Stitcher, Spreaker, iHeartRadio, and Google Play Music. Bunjit, thank you for joining us on the show today. Let's get right into it. Uh, Finequia just announced the setup of a subsidiary company in Malta to hold the company's portfolio of blockchain, fintech, and cryptocurrency technology companies worldwide. Can you talk to our listeners about this strategy and why you chose Malta? Uh, thanks, Ali. Sure. Um, Malta is getting to build a reputation as being the kind of blockchain island or blockchain nation or blockchain country, <laughs> whichever one you want to use, because it's really taking the lead in providing regulatory and legal certainty around the setup and operating operating of a blockchain or crypto company. And for the kind of early innovators and pioneers, that's really critical, um, as it is for investors, because the concern is Either the regulator switches or changes its mind about things and because it hasn't provided certainty, they're operating in a gray space. So entrepreneurs are working on kind of subjective interpretations of what they believe the regulator is going to hold true. The regulator may, in fact, come out the other way. So, for example, in the U.S., there have been um, token offerings, which many ICO companies have believed uh, to be utility tokens. But, you know, more recently, the SEC's view is that pretty much all token offerings in one way or the other are security. They're basically security tokens. So, you know, if they now look back retrospectively and say, well, the token offering of 2016, which you put out as a unregulated offering as a utility, which is basically you're looking at as being kind of a voucher, well, in actual fact, it's a security because it has these qualities um, and it, you know, the litmus test, whichever test they use, the Howey test or whatever, makes it, you know, qualifies it as a, as a security token, then people who raise money on the basis of being a utility token certainly could be a part of the law. And that uncertainty hampers both uh, entrepreneurs who want to build blockchain and crypto companies uh, when they're doing ICOs, and, and second, of course, it, it you know, uh, is not great news for investors who may suddenly find themselves investing in a company that may be unlawful. So, you know, when other countries have taken a lead, it's largely to provide regulatory and legal certainty, so you avoid those pitfalls. Businesses love certainty, and insofar as Malta passed three bills recently, the Innovation Technology Arrangements and Services Act, the Virtual Financial Assets Act and the Malta Digital Innovation Authority Act, all of those ultimately help companies that are developing blockchain technologies that are looking at offering tokens because blockchains and tokens kind of coexist and making token offerings via international client offerings or ICOs um, possible and predictable. And, and that's what, you know, drove us to Malta. We've been operating in Malta, um, you know, via different companies for several years now for, you know, probably the last eight, ten years, even before we set this up. So we are quite familiar with the legal and regulatory and accounting and finance setup, and it's a country where English is spoken as, a, as an official language. We've met the head of the Malta financial regulator in the, in the past, um, and we are quite, you know, well woven into their fabric of how things work. So for us, it was a, it was a relatively easy decision. And, and the fact that they're taking such a leadership role in, in the blockchain crypto world just made it made it easy for us to set up um, an entity there quite quickly. Great. Can you discuss some of the holdings that will be placed in Finequia Investments Limited and what the criteria is looking for new technologies moving forward? Sure. So, you know, we... Um, We've announced three investments so, so far for Finexia um, International, which is a parent company that's uh, based out of Canada and listed in Canada. Um, and the three companies are, one is a premium finance, which is basically a financing company to prepay the cost of insurance premiums, hence it's called premium finance. 
Uh, company, which is funny enough, registered in Malta. Uh, we set that up there a few years ago. Uh, and it's been backed by some of the top investors in the world. Many of them are active in the uh, blockchain crypto world, such as Vapor, um, the investment vapor of Sin Vapor, the Silicon Valley billionaire, who's very, um, outspoken in terms of being a supporter of, of uh, blockchain and crypto. Um, and it's via his, uh, UK franchise, uh, investment firm called Vapor Street. Um, and Rakuten, which is a leading e-commerce company out of Japan that owns, uh, amongst other companies, companies like Viber, um, Cobra out of, uh, Canada, and also has various other fintech and ride-sharing companies that are in its portfolio, such as Lyft and Cabify. So, you know, we're, we're very happy to have them on board, and also, you know, from a Canadian perspective, the Thompson family, which is the, um, the uh, investment vehicle of Peter Thompson, namely Tom Best Ventures is a shareholder. So, so for Nick, to be a shareholder alongside them is actually great. We're in a great peer group, of, not even peer group, but a really contested group of investors. Um, and we have plans for, you know, um, um, supporting that investment in Frontina and making that, you know, grow as it looks at blockchain, the DLT technologies, and then potentially looks at ICO for itself. So that's one, one company. Um, the other one is a, uh, insurance company that's, uh, built on the blockchain, or rather being built on the blockchain. It's based out of Estonia. Estonia has had, you know, some very great tech startups. Uh, Skype came out of uh, engineers based in Estonia. Um, and the recent a company called TransferWise, which is the money transfer business, has an Estonian founder with a lot of development down there. So they're known to be deep tech, and the guys who we back are basically people who We've been running an insurance software company for several years. They've come out from the insurance and software industry, so they're really well placed to to build an insurance company on the blockchain, and that's what makes this really exciting for us um, in terms of supporting them. And they're also looking at creating a multi-company because Malta is very friendly towards setting up of insurance companies. A lot of companies set up um, their underwriting things out of Malta, so having the combination of a Insurance business and a crypto business, uh, out of Malta makes a lot of sense. Right now the company is, uh, based out of Estonia, but as they become more of an insurance company, they'll probably set up their insurance parent out of Malta. So that, that also, of course, dovetails the other investment we made in Confina for that finances insurance premium. So there's a nice kind of terrestrial effect between the portfolio there. So you've already kind of touched on this already, but since you are based in Europe and you travel quite a lot and you're looking at companies in Estonia and Malta, what are your thoughts and what are you seeing in terms of a more regulatory environment? You know, what's really interesting is when we got approved by the UK financial regulator called the FCA for our um, crypto asset-backed bond recently, which is one of the first um, out in the UK uh, to be done. So we were one of the few companies that got um, approved by um, by the regulator as a blockchain company. Um, you know, the the FCA has a particular protected program for um, startups called the or not even startups, just new initiatives. They could be from an established um, bank, for example. Um, and, and, and this thing called a sandbox regime, which allows for protections for investors, a control environment for the technology companies looking to offer it. And of the total number of applications, the uh, 40% of, of uh, those accepted were blockchain companies. So, you know, the UK is looking very promising in terms of being able to uh, allow for this innovation and provide a regulatory um, incubation, if you may, for, for such companies. Um, and, and, you know, we, we were amongst other startups in that space, and, and the company we invested in called Devora has also been through that SBA found lots before. You know, as well as, you know, companies like Barclays have had, you know, their new products approved by the FT within, within the sandbox. So, we think the UK is, 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 a, is a healthy market for it, and the regulators taking a very enlightened view towards it. Um, are they as aggressive as some other ones? No, like Malta and Japan could probably stand out as two countries that are really, really pushing the boundaries in that right now. But to be fair, some of the smaller countries like Malta and Japan could have more, more to gain and less to lose. Um, so they, they're taking a more proactive approach. 
Um, we've seen some places like Sud in, in uh, Switzerland have that approach, but sometimes there's a bit, a bit of a backpedaling on that. Um, and certainly countries in the Baltics, which have always been tech pioneers, Estonia has allowed for like a, an e-citizenship, so you can register yourself and get a biometric ID that basically reveals your ID and, and KYC and other customer procedures um, digitally, so you can, it makes it a lot easier to conduct business because your, your uh, KYC, that check that needs to be done by companies or, or financial institutions is, is facilitated, you know, very, very quickly and in a very credible manner. So, you know, there's, there are some regimes that are looking at this in, in more progressive ways. There's some that are evaluating it but they haven't taken a stance. It's really hard to get kind of unison amongst regulators. You've seen that in Canada where, you know, different provinces have different um, speeds and, and trajectories when it comes to approving um, blockchain or crypto-related regulations and legislation. So to have that across countries is even more complex. Uh, but I truly believe those ones that are taking a more progressive approach um, will, will, you know, lead the, will lead the market in the future because, you know, one reason why the West uh, and in particular the U.S. really capitalized on the early days of the Internet is because they allowed for that to happen. They didn't charge e-commerce companies tax. There was no implementation of some kind of bit uh, tax or bit rate tax. It was basically charging for every bit or byte of information that was going across that was proposed in, in Europe at the time. And having that kind of um, protected environment in the U.S. will be allowed for the likes of Amazon and Google and eBay to, to you know, basically flourish. So I think countries that allow for that will take the lead in getting the next generation of, you know, uh, internet, whatever, 3.0 or 4.0 companies that utilize the blockchain to, to flourish and they'll take uh, advantage of that early lead. Looking at uh, blockchain and crypto markets today, they're still pretty early stages. Uh, for adoption and acceptance, what do you see looking five years out, and how are you building that into your investment strategy? So we look at two things. We, you know, going back to the kind of internet analogy, where you know this is, you know, some would say 1998, some would say, you know, you know, go back to 2018 to 1998. That's one analogy. Some would say go back to like 1988 or something. You know, when it was really uh, very, very, very technical. It was the start of the U.S. Uh, defense program and some education institutions were basically using the internet um, in the early days. Um, you can look at it as being the early days of electricity. This is, you know, it's like we're laying down the cables for an electric network, an electric grid, and we're we're trying to see what would be a microwave oven equivalent. You just can't. You can't look at electric cables being laid down in the early part of this last century and say. Well, guess what? We'll have microcomputers and we'll have microwave ovens and, you know, uh, smartphones. It's just too much of a stress of imagination for most of us. But what we can look is the building blocks. And, and in the past, uh, when the Internet grid was being laid down, it was basically the network for transferring data. It was the network for transferring um, or creating a communication protocol to transfer content. Uh, and most of our, our uh, utilization of the Internet today is for transferring content. Some of it may be transactional that you basically purchase, but at the end of the day, you're, you're moving files, you're moving images, you're moving videos, you're moving text. Um, this next build-out that's occurring with, with, the, with the blockchain backend and the token offerings is for transferring value and for recording value, measuring value, storing value, and accounting for value. And... That is where, you know, our efforts like we invest in, in the war is because they're creating a platform for uh, alliance and security to be distributed. They're the infrastructure, this is the picks and shovels infrastructure era of the uh, internet, you know, 4.0, if you know. And, and we're also looking at companies that will tap into that infrastructure to disrupt businesses. We, you know, every crypto conference I go to, Always has in the insurance industry is one industry that's kind of ripe for innovation via a blockchain offering. So, you know, we kind of took our pick in that market and said the black insurance has a decent chance of, of having a crack at that market. Um, and we've seen other companies that are, are fintech companies saying they want to use the blockchain back end to, you know, create a new business model and, and pivot away from a classic 
uh, pure play fintech model to a blockchain enabled one, and that's where Consina fits into us. So, you know, in the kind of short to medium term, it's the infrastructure and early adopters that we use the blockchain and the cryptocurrency world to disrupt an existing industry that have good financial backing, that have a great vision, solid founding team, um, and, and basically have a crack at creating a whole new protocol, a whole new way of doing business for an existing line of business. So we're not looking at you know, brand new businesses that haven't existed. This is insurance, this is financing that's been there, but it's doing it a different way and, and using the blockchain back end to transfer value and create different forms of settlement and reconciliation of, of value transfers in a much more efficient and transparent way than it's been done currently. So, you know, um, we're not restricted by geography. <laughs> the one thing about the crypto world is that, you know, geography don't matter in the same manner they did in the <laughs> past. Businesses are global from day one and, and you build a DLP and you build a foundation, play with that to kind of, you know, open out the architecture, then you're really playing to a different vision of the world in the future. It's just you really have to stretch out your imagination to start thinking of microwave ovens when you're still laying on the copper. Do you think in five, ten years out, Starbucks will still be saying no to cryptocurrencies, or do you think it will be more accepted by since then? You know, there's the, the one thing about the Internet that really helped its adoption was the fact that it went from being something that was kind of um, opaque and obscure and, and hard to understand to, very, some, to become something very, very relevant, meaningful, and, and easily accessible, particularly email. It was the one killer app that made things work really well. And, and I think when blockchain and cryptocurrencies touch the consumer end, that makes a lot of difference in terms of relevance and accessibility. So, you know, Starbucks, which apparently looking at uh, offering uh, payment acceptance and, uh, using crypto coins will suddenly make a big difference in, in the retail space. It'll make it much more visible to the end customer, and that has a disruptive potential. Um, if on the capital markets you have new products like ETFs that, you know, the SEC may approve during the course of this year, that could become an interesting way for financial uh, markets to get more acquainted with, with the products underneath uh, uh, an ETF offering that has, you know, a crypto denomination underneath it. So I, I do think that it's a question of time. Uh, what we do know in the meanwhile is that there's a lot of efficiencies being built into new protocols. So when we had the last kind of rise in cryptocurrency values, the euphoria of the rise in, in price increases was often offset and tempered by the kind of disappointment a lot of investors had when it came to exchanging their cryptocurrencies for fiat currencies and vice versa because the speeds were slow. It would take several days to transfer the processes of open accounts from the KYC and AML procedures perspective was really, really slow and cumbersome. I think with new transactions for second protocols that are faster than before, more security layers, more sharding. Um, the the next experience we we'll have when there is an uptick in the market will be much more pleasant. And and therefore you see I think more people coming on board and staying there because while the markets may go through their cycles of, you know, euphoria and, and, and you know, disappointment, there's underlying build-up going on constantly by uh, technologists and programmers that are basically making the back-end extremely uh, more efficient than in the past. And that, I think, will be much more visible as we see new apps and new um, protocols emerge for for new products. And, and I think we're, we're into our next wave of that. And, you know, when that new tsunami hits us in terms of a market up, upswing, we don't know, but it's not a question of uh, if it's purely a question of when. And as a personal note to end the interview, can you share with us one of your favorite stories or favorite companies you've found along the way as you've been working in blockchain and crypto over the years? Uh, interesting question. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> there is so many of them out there. You know, I've seen companies that are looking at um, fractional ownership of Ride sharing cars so that you're no longer um, just using an Uber or Lyft, but you're also a shareholder because you are owning a car, especially as they become driverless. 
Um, so there's there's some really interesting startup plays there. I think one huge area uh, which is untapped right now is the media production world. So movies or either the box office or the, the, the likes of Netflix where you're broadcasting and, and basically subscribing to online content has huge potential for, for fractional ownership and, and pricing of content based on dynamic supply and demand. Um, and then we're seeing some really interesting things in the healthcare space. Uh, again, where you're, you know, the, um, the kind of synergy between your lifestyle and the pricing of your insurance based on the, the risk that comes out of that lifestyle gets dynamically priced. So, you know, if I had to pick an area that I find interesting to answer your question in a long kind of convoluted way, um, I believe that, you know, there's, there's a couple of companies that we're seeing that are trying to create the equivalent of a credit score, but creating your, your insurance score. So if you are living more healthily and you are driving, uh, uh, you know, whatever the right word is, more safely compared to the others, <laughs> and, and your, and your house has better, uh, UV protection and there's fewer water leaks, uh, and, and, and less carbon monoxide detection on monitors, you are a low risk insurance customer. And, and you can not only, uh, use that as a score to get a lower, uh, cost of insurance premiums, you can actually put that in the marketplace and say, here's my score and let people bid for your insurance premiums. And that's super early, uh, but I think that's where the industry will go because just like the credit scoring industry emerged in the past based on your, uh, history of repayment of the debt, I think there's going to be this combination of telematics meets, you know, your, your app on your phone or your watch, which, which governs your, uh, which monitors your, your lifestyle along with your home and, and how kind of safe you're keeping it and, and, and the dynamic pricing that for insurance is going to be a really interesting play that's, you know, to be super disruptive for very kind of top-down methods of looking at price and insurance based on generic screens rather than tailored insurance products for individuals. Does that make sense? No, yeah, that's great. Very exciting. Well, thank you so much for the interview today, Pandeep. Fantastic. Thank you, Kelly. To help you follow and track sectors, Investor Ideas has created stock directories of publicly traded stocks for investors to use as a research tool to start trading and investing. Visit InvestorIdeas.com forward slash membership to learn more about our stock directories and leading sectors. Investor Ideas reminds all listeners to read our disclaimers and disclosures on the Investor Ideas website. And this podcast is not an endorsement to buy products or services or securities. Investors are reminded all investment involves risk and possible loss of investment. For disclosure purposes, Finequia International is a paid for news, PR, and social media client on InvestorIdeas.com. 